The Ozark Mountains are pretty creepy, and sometimes, if you're lucky or unlucky, you might even hear this strange howl that sounds like nothing else in the world. That may just be the Ozark Howler. What you're about to hear are episodes 8 and 9 of Camping Horrors, featuring relaxing nature sounds, witches, and werewolves. Enjoy! Be sure to send me your scary camping and hiking stories at darkstories.org so I can narrate them. Also, rate and follow Camping Horrors on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Thank you. Now, throw a log on the fire, because the night is still young. The following story contains photographic evidence. Please see the links in the description to see all eight photos for yourself. Camping at Mount Rainier from Mr. Anonymous. I recently went on a camping trip with my family to Mount Rainier. It was my father, his dog, who's deaf and 14 years old, my brother, sister-in-law, niece, and my brother's wife's sister. We have this one camping spot where weird things happen to us every time we stay there. The last time was the most unsettling. In the past, We've seen lights in the sky that couldn't be traditional aircraft nor satellites, just blue dots moving in an irregular pattern, and we woke up in the morning nauseous, not remembering what else happened. This time, however, was very different. One of the nearby trees has In Loving Memory carved into it, for a couple that died in 2000, that we didn't notice prior to setting up. The first night we were there, I was up around 12 to 12.30 a.m. when I heard a man singing. The singing was getting closer and closer to our campsite, so I grabbed my knife and held it close to my chest. The singing abruptly stopped, and I heard a male and female having a conversation, but it was too muddled to make out any words. I heard one of them walk in between my tent that I was sleeping alone in and the tree that was about three feet away from me. The other walked opposite, so they could circle my camp. The strangest part was that there was never a flashlight, and it was quite dangerous to walk around in the camp without light. We had this sort of cliff on the side that went into the Nisqually River. The voices and walking randomly stopped, but they never sounded like they walked away from us. Eventually, it was so quiet for so long, I was able to sleep, though I still clutched the knife tightly. In the morning, I asked around to see if anyone else heard anything, keeping what I heard a secret as to not put thoughts into their heads. My father said he'd heard a man and woman talking that night, and my sister-in-law's sister said that someone shook her tent. I had never felt more validated, yet scared, before as the whole interaction was about 15 minutes long. Sadly, that's not the only strange thing that happened on that trip either. A day before, when we were looking for other campsites, because we didn't want to stay in the one where weird things happen, we found an abandoned camp. It looked like the people took essentials and ran. They left a $300 tent, two queen air mattresses, blankets, pillows, diapers, etc., and on the tent, they had a notice from the park rangers saying it was there for over 14 days. I'll add the pictures. The second night there, my family and I were walking down the river for a quiet little night hike. I was ahead of them and got to a small forested section when I started to hear a growl coming from in front of me and to the side. I put my walking stick in a defensive position as I know there can be bears in the area. I also slowly walked backwards, making sure not to show my back to whatever it was. I told my family we needed to turn back to grab some bear mace from the camp just in case and stay at camp. The next morning, before we packed up to go, I still wanted to adventure over to that area. I went on my own and stumbled upon these two prints in the sand. One of them was a human-like foot that was twice the width of mine 
and about three inches longer. The other was a handprint that made mine look like a toddler's hand. I'm not saying it was a Bigfoot or a cryptid, but whatever it was, it had to be over six and a half feet tall. I'll also be adding pictures of those prints. It could have very well been a tall person with abnormally large hands like my dad has. They're swollen due to an illness he has. But even his weren't even close enough to being that big. Also, I don't know what a person would be doing walking along the side of the river barefoot. If you know anything about Washington, you know that there's constantly sharp rocks along the rivers and ocean with very little sand. I'm not sure what either of these situations really were. My sister, who wasn't there, seems to think I encountered the ghosts of the couple that passed through there and that I maybe ran into a Bigfoot. I'm skeptical at best. I think there was a couple scoping out our campsite and a very tall, homeless person walking around the other area. Though I am open to suggestions... Creepy Vacation From Anonymous I am 16 years old. I was born and raised in the Dominican Republic, but I now live in New York. I was on vacation back in the Dominican Republic in a town called Sabana Iglesia, which belongs to Santiago. There are more smaller towns, but Sabana Iglesia is more well known due to its population which is no more than seven or 10,000 people. I used to live southeast from there, like 10 miles away. There's a much smaller town called El Flair, which holds a population no more than 1,000, and that's three or four miles from where I used to live, where this incident occurred. It happened back when I lived in the Dominican Republic. Where I lived then, I have to say, the place is beautiful and peaceful. There we all grew up in the woods, and we knew the area well. The small amount of people that lived there made it easy to remember everybody's names and pretty much where they lived. This small place is called El Corral. It's called this because it only has one easy entrance and exit, as it is surrounded by woods, small mountains that will make you sweat if you hike there midday, and also the largest river in the Dominican Republic, Rio Yaque del Norte, which goes from west and passes to the east making a curve where I live, blocking most of the ways to get out. That's why it has this name. My cousins that still live there are teens, around 16 I think. One was there when this took place, and the other came from the city of Santiago to have a good time. We were all spending time in the river playing water tag, which is tag but in the water of course. We were cliff diving too and a lot of other things, now, as small as the town was, it had its own scary stories. All of them were related to witches that were said to pass by from two other towns called Yerba de Calebre and Loma de Coco. Our parents, grandparents, and most of the people there tell us a lot of encounters about the paranormal and ghost stories. We all believe this stuff due to all of these stories we've been told, and some of us at one point have seen creepy things. Even I think I've seen ghosts twice. Most of the people that live in small towns or in the countryside have had experiences with a certain creature called Galipotes. If you try to search for it, it's possible you won't find much information about it. But a Galipote looks like a well-dressed man, like a man who has been working in an office. But he could be a few yards next to you and if you saw him again, he would somehow suddenly be much farther away. Not terribly scary. The last sighting I'd heard about was around 2008 or 2009, but in the 90s and 80s, there were more people living there and they were more common. As I said, we believe in witches, and stories and sightings of those were common around 1960, but started to fade out in 2008. Now, a different, bizarre encounter you might have that was more common was when you go into the woods in the hills, you would find strings hanging from the tops of trees. People say the witches do this to mark their routes, and it does make sense, I guess. I mean, what normal hiker would put cloth strings 
on top of very tall trees to mark their paths. That would be way too much effort for a normal person. Not to mention, these would be found in places people don't often go for months. Now, one Sunday, September 3rd, I remember this because Hurricane Irma happened three or four days after. My friends and I were planning on going to El Flair. We were at the river, which is only three minutes from my grandparents' house, where my friend Stephen was staying. Jordan, another friend, lives right next to him, and I wasn't too far from their houses. We were going to have a good time, hiking through and playing in the woods, trying to meet up with some girls. You know, teenager stuff. We were supposed to meet at 7pm, and at the time it was 6pm. Christian, the other friend, left to his house to change and have dinner. We did the same. I lived with my great-grandparents back then. We ate, and soon Stephen went with me to get my stuff to get ready. We were going to get Jordan. When we got to his place, we called out for him, and he met us outside. Before going to Christian's house, we actually called him on the phone, but he didn't pick up, so we had to walk there and go get him. Now going to Jordan's house leads to this bad road, surrounded by woods to the right and hills to the left. At the time, the sun was going down. It was 7.05 p.m. when I looked at my phone last. Eventually, we got to Christian's house. We called for him so we could leave. By then, it was 7.17. Christian did come out and joined us, so we made the journey back, went up the road, passed another house where one of my cousins lived, and kept walking, reaching this flat area that looks down to my cousin's place, and the other side is a grassy hill. We kept walking past this flat area. We soon made it to the road that leads to El Flair and Yerba del Culebra. As we walked on and on, I soon noticed dark clouds gathering and coming our way, almost blocking the nearly full moon, which was a few days away from being completely full. I told the guys, don't tell me we came all the way out here just to have to go back. They ignored what I said, so we just kept walking. Eventually, we made it to where all the folks used to hang out, but that night, there was no one there, and all the stores were closed. We took a break, eating some chips and drinking some soda. Afterwards, we chilled, talking and using our phones. By 9.30pm, I looked up and saw that the clouds were getting thicker. It looked as if it was about to rain. I let the guys know, but they still didn't care. So I kept on tinkering with my phone. At 10 p.m., lightning struck close to us, and the rain started to come down. Finally, we decided to leave. As we were making the long hike back in the dark and in the rain, suddenly, a rock was thrown in front of Stephen, who was leading our group. We stopped then. He looked down to see what was thrown at him exactly. Two or three seconds after that, we heard this strange laughing sound coming from a tree right in front of Stephen to the right of us. I looked over at the trees. They had wires on them, which were there to separate the land where sometimes my uncle's cows grazed. But there were no cows there tonight. I looked and saw this black bird passing right through two of the trees. Freaked out, we were all about to bolt. We went on, trying to remain calm, approaching my parents' place. When we got there, I told my mom what happened, and she said right away, That's a witch. She asked exactly where we saw it, and we explained. She then said some weird things happen there sometimes. We stayed there until we calmed down, but then we left to go to Stephen's place. On our walk there, another rock was thrown, this time landing on a metal roof on one of the nearby houses, making a loud noise. We all started to just look at each other. We knew it was none of us. Better yet, there were no rocks around here. It was all grass. Rocks would have been further back where that first rock had initially been thrown. Later on, I end up back at my grandparents' house, explaining to them the night's events, and they too believed it was a witch. The following day, most of the people knew about what had happened to us because word had spread, and nearly everyone believed it was a witch too. In fact, other people, such as Jordan's grandmother's sister, had also had rocks thrown at her when she was going back home one day. 
We grew up there, and this didn't change how we felt about our home. Even still, it was quite an eerie thing to experience. Ozark Werewolf From Barner 2424 My buddy Rick and I try to take a guy's camping trip to the Ozarks every autumn. We've been doing these trips since high school to fish, hike, and hunt. A few years back, we planned a three-day weekend camping excursion in early November. As always, we spent the week leading up packing supplies, tents, sleeping bags, cooler, non-perishable food, rifles, ammo. We preferred camping deep in the backwoods, away from other people, because it made us feel as if we had the wilderness to ourselves. We left on a Friday morning, driving several hours to reach the remote forest area we had scoped out on maps weeks before. We turned off the main roads onto narrow dirt paths, rarely traveled except by loggers. Eventually, we reached the overgrown trailhead leading to the secluded spot by a creek we aimed to camp at. We hiked through dense brush and forest for over an hour before reaching the clearing we had chosen as our campsite. The place was perfect. Flat ground to pitch the tents, fallen logs to sit on, the gentle babbling of a nearby creek in which we could fish. We quickly got to work unloading the truck and setting up camp. Soon we had a roaring fire going, and we cracked open a couple of cold ones to toast the start of our weekend. We grilled up some steaks, beans, and potatoes as the sun went down. We were feeling relaxed and optimistic about the days of solitude ahead. Just us two old friends in the wilderness making new memories. As night fell, we occasionally heard distant coyotes howling and owls hooting. But then came these cries that echoed through the darkness, which sounded unlike anything I'd ever heard before. They were like a painful wailing or screaming. Rick and I joked nervously that it must be a skinwalker coming for us clueless city boys. Little did I know, our jokes might hit a little too close to reality. The next morning, Rick and I gulped down some coffee. We geared up for a full day of hunting. The dawn in the forest was serene, mist rising off the creek nearby, and birds chirping in the trees. We hiked over a ridge finding a spot with signs of deer activity to set up. After a couple of hours passed with no sightings, the stillness of the woods began to feel eerie. Usually, we'd have seen some squirrels, birds, or deer by now, but the forest was oddly silent, like all its inhabitants had vanished. Something feel off to you? I asked Rick. He nodded, brow furrowed. We stayed a while longer, but eventually we gave up, heading back to camp empty-handed. Along the way, we discovered strange, huge tracks on the trail that didn't look like any animal we knew. Kind of canine-like, but oddly shaped. A chill went down my spine, imagining what could have left those prints. We decided to call it an early night, anticipating better luck hunting in the morning but sleep eluded me. I kept thinking about those weird cries we'd heard the night before, which sounded so tormented and inhuman. Sometime deep in the night, I awoke to the snuffling and crackling of something rooting around just outside my tent. I lay paralyzed, listening to heavy breaths and twigs snapping underfoot. My blood turned to ice, when I glanced through the mesh window and saw two glowing eyes peering back at me from the dark. I yelled out to Rick, There's something out there! The eyes vanished as quickly as they had appeared. We sat huddled together in Rick's tent, rifles clutched tight, waiting for dawn. Both of us were shaken by the undeniable sense that we were being watched from the shadows. At daybreak, we hastily packed up camp, skipping breakfast. This spot didn't seem so idyllic anymore. 
Rick and I agreed we could not wait to get the heck out of these woods. The two of us hiked back out the way we'd came in, moving at a brisk pace. The sooner we were back in the safety of the truck, the better. We just had to get around a ridge, through a narrow valley, then uphill to the trailhead. Halfway through the valley, we came upon a huge fallen oak blocking the path ahead. Odd that a healthy tree had so recently toppled. We'd stopped just a moment, seconds away from deciding to just climb over it, when we heard a snap of a branch from right behind us. We spun around, rifles raised. There, lurking between the trees, was something so bizarre. A hulking, hairy creature crouched on two legs, staring back at us. It had a wolf-like face, but stood over seven feet tall, its muscular frame covered in grayish-brown fur. A low, rumbling growl emanated from its throat. Rick and I stood frozen in shock and terror. The thing made no move to attack, but its penetrating yellow eyes watched us intently. When I finally mustered the nerve to fire a warning shot near its feet, the beast didn't even flinch. Instead, I saw it bare its fangs and take a step towards us. That's when the chaos really began. Rick tried firing too, but his gun jammed. The creature then let out a bone-chilling snarl and suddenly lunged in our direction. The two of us screamed and reeled backwards, toppling over the fallen tree. I landed hard on my back, the wind knocked out of me. Peering upside down from the ground, I glimpsed the beast's long, jagged claws and muscular hind legs as it briefly towered over us, but in the next instant, it had vanished back into the underbrush. We staggered to our feet, gasping for air, minds blank with primal panic. Without a word, Rick and I began to sprint back up the trail, driven by sheer animal instinct to survive. We didn't speak, didn't plan, only knew we had to make it out of these cursed woods before that thing came back to finish us off. We sprinted through the forest, delirious with fear, the trail seemed to stretch on forever. No matter how hard we pushed our aching legs, the parking lot never got closer. Glancing behind us, I'd catch glimpses of that hulking thing, paralleling our path, easily keeping pace with us. It would duck behind trees or into the brush, flashing in and out of view. I think it was toying with us, like a cat letting the mice think they could escape before going in for the kill. At one point, I tripped on a root and face-planted into the mud. As I staggered up, I came face to face with the beast, who had soundlessly crept up behind me. Its breath was hot, and it reeked of rotting meat. We locked eyes for a split second before it bared its fangs, snarled, and vanished again into the shadows. This told me it could have killed me at any point, if it wanted to. I don't know how, but Rick and I finally stumbled out of the woods and back to the pickup. We floored it down that dirt road like two madmen, reckless and panting, not stopping until we reached the highway. Only then did we trade horrified accounts of what we had just seen. A living nightmare we could scarcely believe. We agreed not to tell a soul what happened. Who would believe us anyway? This thing was no ordinary animal. We'd encountered something unnatural, something evil, in that forest. Neither of us had ever been more terrified or felt so powerless. In the months after, I scoured the internet looking for clues about what we saw. Some cryptid forums suggest it could have been a dogman, or a wolf-like creature they call the Ozark Howler. All I know for sure is we stumbled into the hunting grounds of a monster, one that's likely still roaming the remote wilderness of the Ozarks. No one will ever convince me otherwise. I'll never set foot in those godforsaken woods again.
Hefe, my own personal demon. From Montana Rose. This is the story of the attachment of an entity I call Hefe. This story spans almost two decades and more than two thirds of my life. I am what you could call an elder in a young body. I'm 24 years old, but on the tail end of my second divorce, wrapping up years of traumatic events and misfortunes and life lessons in prolific numbers. I'm beginning to tie together some of this misfortune and trauma to the existence of an attachment between Hefe and myself. I cannot tell you exactly what Hefe is. I wish I knew for sure, but I can tell you what it looks like, what it does, when it does it, how it sounds, and where it hides. I can't even tell you why or how it became attached to me. I was a child when this began, at only seven or eight years old. When I was around seven or eight, my dad and I went on a camping trip to Yosemite. My mom didn't join us on this trip. We'd gone on many trips before as a family, lasting around a week each time, and oftentimes at Big Sur or Yosemite. We pulled into the park having already had a small debate in the car about food and music. I was ready to call my mom because I was already homesick. Though being older now, I think I just missed my mom. She and I could hold a normal conversation. To this day, my dad and I have these debates about mundane and trivial topics. We never stay mad, if we ever even do get mad. A majority of the time, our debates are for the sake of debating. I guess that seems to be our best method of communication. Anyway, we stopped at some place my dad had to check into. We were staying in some sort of a cabin by a location of a historic rock slide. I don't remember as many details as I wish I did. This can be attributed to a series of concussions resulting in a TBI, or traumatic brain injury. I do remember that we walked over to an area with a phone. My dad dialed my mom and I'd begun, as many young children do, to jump around and wander and mess with things. I don't recall having wandered off too far, but I suppose I had, as my dad called my name with a hint of both irritation and fear in his inflection. So I trotted back over to where he was. He handed me the phone so I could talk to my mom. As I was on the phone, I felt a searing pain on the back of my right thigh, and I suddenly cried out. My dad came over and shouted at me for messing around beside the phone and causing me to cut myself. In a state of confusion, I asked my dad what he was talking about. He prepared a first aid kit from the red backpack he always had on him, something he still keeps with him to this day. He asked for the phone back. I told my mom I loved her and handed it back to my dad, who handed me the first aid kit, asking me to clean the cut on the back of my thigh. I sat down on the ground, and in the most awkward way conceivable, I lifted my right leg with my arm and searched for this alleged cut. I indeed did have a cut, though as deep as it was and long as it was, that word feels like a joke. I took out the alcohol swabs, as my dad taught me to do many times before. I proceeded to scrub the ever-living tar out of my leg while biting my lip to hold back tears, which inevitably spilled over anyways. After scrubbing for what felt like ages, I packed the cut full of Neosporin, like my mom always prompted me to do. She carries the stuff everywhere and uses it on everything. Acne? Neosporin. Cut? Neosporin. Cracked lips? Neosporin. Even if the dog cut their paw pad again, it's Neosporin time. By this point, my dad had finished the phone call and was now squatting in front of me. I can recall him mentioning stitches and me shaking my head like a mad person with wide eyes. My dad let out an exasperated sigh. Being queasy around blood, he whipped out a massive band-aid. He used it to pull together the sides of the gash and cover it up. This was one of those fancy watertight band-aids my dad saved for me, because I was known to be found in creeks, mud, trees, or some other area, likely teeming with dirt, debris, and the germs my parents were so wary of. Our trip carried on afterward with very little out-of-the-ordinary activity to note. The days passed by with excitement and joy, and adventures and exploring. My dad, to this day, 
as my favorite adventuring buddy. He and I climbed mountains and found views of waterfalls. We went hiking and went to group campfires. At one point, I made friends with a girl close to my age, staying at a cabin nearby with her grandfather. On the third to last day of our trip, my dad was exhausted, but he allowed me to explore the remnants of the rock slide behind our cabin. I had gone out there on my own, armed with a pencil and sketch pad, coated thoroughly in bug spray as mosquitoes seemed to think I'm an amazing buffet. As I wandered between the boulders and the remnants of a squished cabin, I came across a deer with red hair and limbs that looked too long and awkward for its body. It was standing beside a massive round boulder. That boulder stood at around ten eight-year-old me's in height, and the deer beside it stood at about two. I will note here I've always been tall for a girl. Today, as an adult, I stand at six foot two, and back then, I would have been around four foot eleven to five foot two, based on the lines left on the doorframe of our old house. That deer locked eyes with me, and I felt pure dread. Something about its gaze felt wrong. There was something up with its eyes. I couldn't really place it, though. I can only speculate what it was that bothered me in retrospect. You see, I believe those eyes appeared human. My dad then called, and I looked back to our cabin. When I turned toward the boulder where the deer was, it was no longer there. All that remained was my sense of dread. I took off like a bat out of heck for the sound of my dad's voice and the safety of our cabin. That was the last time I saw or felt such strange and alarming and dread-inducing activity for a few years. I pushed these events and memories away. I thought about them only when certain events began to induce the same feelings again. When I was ten, my parents found a dog at the Humane Society in our county. Her name was Bella, but I'm pretty sure she hated that name. So we called her Lady May. Lady May was eventually trained as my service dog and was my first lifeline in the adult world. The year after our family adopted and trained Lady, we went on a trip to Calaveras Big Trees Giant Sequoia Forest as a family. Before we got to our camping spot there, my dad wanted to visit Yosemite and show my mom one of the sites we had visited when we stayed there a few years back. When we stopped, I felt that dread set in again. Lady seemed to know this, and she became more clingy and protective over me than typical of her. As she was a large dog and a rather independent breed, this was comforting and also mildly alarming. When your big ol' independent dog begins clinging to and protecting your child, you should take notice. Naturally, my parents attributed this to our being in a new and unfamiliar place, while I attributed it to some far less realistic reasons. We didn't stay at Yosemite long before piling back into the car and making our way to our camping spot at Calaveras to set up camp and begin exploring. This camping trip would be memorable for a plethora of reasons, including me almost being kidnapped and being saved by my trusty best friend, Lady attempting to catch and unalive numerous squirrels throughout our vacation time. My dad also wrecked two doors of his brand new truck on a one inch in diameter sequoia sapling, which apparently didn't know the definition of quit. I even found a fun junior ranger group to go with in the evening, learning about the park and its natural inhabitants. Our first day was intriguing and eventful with Lady cornering a squirrel in the first five minutes when I let her off her lead, and as I mentioned, Dad wrecked the doors of the truck backing into our campsite. While Lady was busy harassing her squirrel and Mom and Dad were addressing the damage to the truck, I saw the most gorgeous orange and yellow bird fly through our campsite, perching on a tree only a mere 20 feet away. Being a curious and mildly dumb kid, I tried to get closer and continued to follow this new and exciting creature as it flitted from tree to tree, playing keep away. Soon the sound of my parents' exasperated words was lost to the sounds of the woods, the chirping of cicadas, the crunch of needles, branches beneath my tennis shoes. I realized I could no longer hear my parents at some point, 
and when I did, I was absolutely lost. In what was around 90 degree heat, I went colder than the Arctic. I began to acknowledge the dread that set in, and the panic beginning to rear its ugly and non-productive head in my mind. As I was about to sit down and wait, because what else do you do in a state of dread and panic except become overwhelmed and sit down to wait for the inevitable? Lady came crashing into view, barking and foaming at the mouth, as she often did when she ran at an all-out sprint for too long. I was so extremely happy to see her. I threw my arms around her and proceeded to bury my head in her neck while she stoically stood there panting and drooling. Lady was three at the time, and she was a beautiful mix of Rhodesian Ridgeback and Pitt. She was amazingly fast and loved to run, but when she sprinted you could hardly follow her with your eyes. The telltale sign of her having been sprinting recently is foam coming out of her mouth, rolling off of her tongue. When I let go of her, she pushed past me a little bit to help me stand up. I placed a hand on her broad shoulder and braced myself while I lifted my body into a standing position. Lady boofed and turned around to walk me back to our campsite. We walked in a relative quiet. I enjoyed the sounds of her pants and the chirps of cicadas. When we got back to our site, my parents were still preoccupied, so I poured Lady a big dish of water, petting her while she sloppily drank some. This was another telltale sign of her overexerting herself. As a desert breed, Lady had rarely ever slopped up water the way she did that day. The noisiness of her drinking caused my parents to stop and notice. My mom gave me and Lady a quizzical once-over before turning back to my dad, continuing their conversation. This would not be the last strange happening on our trip but it would be the first time my parents were forced to notice something more may be going on. Later on in the trip, we went on a scenic tour of where the biggest tree had been felled. Lady stayed at the campsite with my mom, so it was only me and my dad. I remember looking into a portion of the felled tree that was twice my height and hollowed out, and I saw inside these feral-looking human eyes peering out from shadows and darkness. I sucked in my breath and shut my eyes while a shiver passed up and down my spine. My dad, doing the daddest thing ever, smacked my shoulder and said, let's keep moving, Twinkle Toes. Your mom's probably missing us. I nodded furiously and we kept on moving. When we got back after the tour, which I managed to get a boatload of pictures of, Lady trotted up to me, sniffing me obsessively, before plopping down beside me and cocking her head to one side. That same day, I took Lady for a short walk a little later on, bumping into a park ranger who proceeded to ask why I was out alone at a young age. She wasn't amused by my overly confident answers. She walked me back to our campsite. She did seem impressed at my being ballsy enough to go out by myself while the sun was setting and invited me to come to the Junior Rangers group each evening for the rest of the week. Naturally, Lady went with me each time, and it was at this group that I learned the name of the bird I saw, which I'm convinced led me into the woods to be kidnapped somewhere. It was a western tanager. The remainder of the week went by in a blur. Lady stayed at my side for almost every second of the remainder of the trip. Little else happened for a few more years to come. My family moved out of California the year I was to turn 14. At 13, I very quickly became a problem child, and my mom missed her home in the panhandle of Idaho. As we began the 11-day drive from our little town on the coast of California to our new home in Kootenai County, we stopped to reminisce some of our trips and good memories. My parents tried to take the time to show me that they wanted a brighter future for me and create a promise of new adventures and new places to explore. At the time, my mind was clouded by angst and grief for what I was leaving behind, because it was all I'd ever known. We stopped briefly at Yosemite, and we drove through Calaveras. We stopped nearby in Stockton for a night, which turned into a few nights due to the theft of our catalytic converter, before driving on to our next stop in Oregon. During our time reminiscing, 
I became overshadowed with dread on top of the existing angst and grief. These emotions stayed tangled inside of me for months, maybe even years after moving. The darkness and dread would be present in me throughout many events of trauma and suffering. It would be so loud and overbearing, it would drown out logic and reason, and my ability to recover. The noise and bluntness of these raw emotions drowned out my ability to function following a series of traumatic assaults when I was 16, and the bullying I was subjected to at 17. It would overshadow my ability to seek help when my first real friend betrayed me in the worst way, and when a boy began to obsess and stalk me at 18. But this dread overrode all of that. It was more urgent than the physical pain or human-inflicted fear and trauma, making it impossible to feel and heal enough. I mean, you have to feel things to heal. I know this adage to be my truth, and I try to practice it every day. A year or so ago, sometime after the start of COVID, I took a job at a large chain company run elderly care facility. I intentionally chose the NOC shift to avoid unnecessary drama and interaction with other people. I worked with one other person during the shift, and that would either be my coworker, C or M. On most nights, I worked with coworker C. She was older and not nearly as green as most of the other employees of the facility. She trained me, and she had my back as much as possible during my short time there. Within the first week of my being on NOC shift with C, we endured quite a bit. Doors flying open at us and slamming shut, usually on me. Footsteps pacing up and down the halls, running noises in one of the stairwells, crawling or scuttering sounds in the vents, and at one point I got locked in one of the laundry rooms while the room was around 90 degrees. C had heard voices sometimes, behind doors that had just opened or shut, or around the corner when she could hear pacing. She swore up and down that it had to be me, as it sounded like my voice, but I was rarely ever near at the time she heard it, and one time I came out of the stairwell right after she'd heard it coming from a resident's room, so it couldn't have been me. C was furious that someone or something was harassing us at work, I took a night off to see my then-significant other at the time, and when I came back, C asked me if the building felt different. For the first time, I could acknowledge that I felt no dread somewhere. I felt safe. But this safety would be short-lived, as I moved into a new facility and new troubles soon after. My first marriage came and went, ending with him hitting me with his car, and it was intentional. During the first two weeks of my first marriage, abuse began to manifest. On weekends, we would go to bonfires out in Hayden Creek. It was on one of these nights when he first put his hands on me, and we saw what I believe was the same entity from every other incident, which now looked like an odd elk. We were all piled in his cousin's truck, bumping down a dirt back road, when two elk took off across the road in front of us. The second of the two elk stopped and locked eyes with us. It had an unnatural reddish hue to its hair, and its legs looked abhorrently long. Seconds ticked by before it turned and took off up the hillside, and we continued on around the bend. Only two short months after this, my first marriage would end on a sour note. I took a job at another large corporation-run elderly care facility, where I underwent being bullied, discriminated against, and severely overworked for more than half a year. I loathed being in that building alone at night, and often worked obsessively, cleaning the place from top to bottom to avoid paying any attention to the dread or terror that would set in at night. I was often in this facility for 16-hour shifts on my own, and this went on for months, with only one or two days off in total. I left this facility to go to a smaller one nearby during my second marriage. My second marriage would end in a myriad of gaslighting and refusals to work on alcoholism. The divorce is still being processed as I'm typing this out. I'm still at this smaller facility. Hefe, as I've come to call him, seems to enjoy it here, and the torment has really begun to pick up. I work the NOC shift here, which runs from 2230 to 0700. 
Our facility is on a rotation of four days on and two days off, but I pick up shifts to work every day with a day off every few weeks. Sometimes I come in early or work the occasional double. The house I work in has a minimum of two staff at all times, even at night. I find this to be a mild comfort, as I also find comfort in my service dog in training, refusing to leave my side during the shift. My service dog in training, while very young, does a fantastic job as my medical alert and has come a very far away in a short time regarding behavior and advanced task training. My service dog in training is a six-month-old German Shepherd named Houdini, and she's amazing. I also want to unequivocally state that Houdini doesn't have a mean bone in her body, and until these incidents, I'd never seen any sign of protection or aggression come out of my little friend. She's actually trained against it, as most service animals are. Within my first week at the facility, I learned that the lights need to stay on at night. When they don't, doors open and shut in the darkness, and we can hear pacing and running up and down the halls. Today, the only lights that get turned off are in the activity room and the TV rooms, and the door to the activity room gets pulled shut. During my second week at this facility, another staff member mentioned feeling a sense of dread. It was as if they were being stalked when the lights were off in the building. The elevator is often heard going to the basement and opening before coming back up to the main and second stories and opening. This happens when no one is on it with the exception of it happening one time when I happened to be on it myself. I'd gotten on the elevator at the start of my third week, and the button on the keypad, which unlocks the elevator's ability to go to the basement, turned green. The door shut, and before I knew it, they were opening to the complete darkness of the facility basement. I stifled a scream with my hand, and Houdini started to bark and growl. I hit the second-story button with inhuman speed, over and over until the doors shut at last. The last thing I saw was green eyes looking at me from the shadows. A few nights later, a co-worker of mine, P, took it upon herself to cleanse the building. This seemed to really tee off Hefe. Another of my co-workers, A, felt a burning pain as this was happening, and while we walked past the upstairs television room, when she lifted her shirt, I saw ugly red lines that looked as if someone tried to claw at her through her uniform. A was terrified, of course, and refused to go anywhere upstairs by herself from then on. An hour after the incident, the protection charm I wore around my neck was ripped off while I pulled the door to the activities room shut. It was tossed over the second-story balcony, the chain breaking cleanly as if someone had grabbed it and pulled it with force. I was also left with a red line on the left side of my neck for nearly a week. For a few days after that, it seemed calm, but the heavy dread still hung stagnant in the air. My fifth week started with a literal bang, a sudden sound while the lights were off. When that happened, the door to the activities room shut, and the attic entrance in that room opened up. After hearing the massive crash of the ladder sliding down and hitting the floor, I heard running in the attic, then what sounded eerily similar to my coworker P's voice coming from the entrance to the attic, saying, You have to see this. You have to come up here. I knew it couldn't possibly be P. She had driven home over an hour ago, and the facility doors are locked after 2300, meaning she would have had to call me to get back in, and the inflection and tone were all wrong. The voice sounded monotonous and robotic, very unlike P's bubbly up-and-down tones. I shuddered as I pushed the door open. I was holding on to my protection charm with my left hand while I groped for the switch to the activity room light with my right hand. I found the light, and I flicked it on to reveal the ladder down and the attic open, just as I had heard. This sight came with the sound of my, at the time, husband's voice. Babe, come here. I want to see you. I also knew this was not my husband, as it sounded wrong as well, like he'd been talking through a radio or phone. It sounded broken and out of context for the situation. I stepped forward to push the ladder up, and in the darkness, 
I saw two green eyes and a slight sheen of red surrounding them in the shape of an inhumanly tall biped. Claws became visible as a hand reached down and grasped the edge of the opening to the attic. I noped the heck out of there at a speed likely unknown to man, only to be forced to return for my service dog in training who was standing at the end of the ladder with her hackles raised, growling like a rabid beast ready to attack. As I grasped Houdini's collar and pulled her back, I pushed up the ladder with as much force as I could and hooked the back of the attic drop-down hatch with my right foot before kicking it up to my hand and slamming that darned thing shut with a window-shaking bang. Following this display, I received about 12 calls from residents who were concerned the building was going to fall down. My partner, Kay, managed to sleep through the entire ordeal. To this day, she can sleep through almost anything, and despite it being a breach of policy, often does just that. I'm on my 15th week at this facility. The attic has opened three times since then, and I've suffered several unexplained invisible attacks, leaving me with cuts on my hands, red marks on my ankles and wrists. In the most recent attack, I was grabbed by the ankles, dragged backwards into the dark activities room, after hearing the door swing open while waiting to get onto the elevator. Naturally, my dog turned into a rabid little heathen, and I managed to crawl away and call her to me. I opted to take the stairs for the rest of the night. Most recently, two nights before Thanksgiving, P worked a double shift, putting her on NOC as my partner. I'm big on cleaning and resident care instead of sitting and scrolling through my phone or screwing around on the company computer. We'd been upstairs polishing the resident display cases, wiping down all the floorboards, when I stopped in front of the activities room door. The lights were off, and the door was locked this time. But I got a really good look at a pair of green eyes looking down at me from a form much taller than mine, covered in rusty red hair. The arms were freakishly long, ending in hands that ended in claws that just barely dragged on the ground. The legs were bent backward like Houdini's back legs, and ended in a similar set of claws that were lightly digging into the ugly brown carpet. I looked up from its clawed feet to see its head framed with horns similar to those of a ram's, but in a sickening shade of bloody red. Its green eyes were fixed on me with hatred and hunger. Drool began to lazily drip from the bubbling foam of the massive biped's mouth. With a thud that shook the glass of the door and caught the attention of P, it dropped onto all fours, opening its foaming mouth and revealing the rest of its only previously previewed razor-sharp canine-like teeth, a long reptilian tongue unfurled from the masses of drool and teeth. It licked the door where my face was, leaving trails of heat from its breath and saliva. Houdini, already bristling, began to let out hateful and guttural growls, I picked her up and proceeded to walk right the heck away. I told P we would not be going near the activities room until dawn broke or hell froze over. She nodded and grabbed the rest of our cleaning supplies to move on to the next wing. Since this incident, I've had two days off due to being prolifically sick. I still managed to work a double on Thanksgiving, which happened to be uneventful to my delight. I'm sure when I get back tonight, it will not be so quiet. Hefe will be hungry. Hefe follows and I don't think he will stop until I'm dead and gone. Hefe is my own personal demon, a variety of which I'm not entirely sure of. A and P both believe he's a skinwalker who has been hunting me since I was a child. If that's true, how do I get rid of it? And why would it follow me all this time? I'm just me. A whole lot of mediocrity that is stitched together with trauma, exasperation, and misplaced care for other people. Thank you for stopping by at our little campsite here at Camping Horrors. To hear your story on the show, send it to us for narration at darkstories.org. For more narrations from me, 
You can catch me on my other podcasts, Unexplained Encounters, and Tales from the Break Room on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or your favorite podcast app. Or you can go to eeriecast.com for those and even more terrifying podcasts. Follow me on X, formerly Twitter, at Dark Prevails. And be sure to leave Camping Horrors a rating and review on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Now then, I'll see you soon when the campfire blazes once again.